Joining us here on WEEI is Chris Mannix of Sports Illustrated. Uh, Chris, first of all, thanks for joining us. And second of all, what's the what's the tie-in here with a casino resort magnet and getting in with the Celtics? Well, I, I think for starters, it's very difficult, given these valuations, to find a a lot of individuals that can afford to buy these teams. Um, it, it's part of the reason why we saw kind of that tiered buying system in Minnesota where Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez put up a, a chunk of money at a time to get to where they need to be. And we saw kind of how that has become a catastrophe uh, in Minnesota. So it's not like there are a lot of, of high net worth individuals that are interested in buying a team and have the, the resource to buy a team. The interest from a, a potential casino magnet, and let's use Win and its ownership group as, as an example, since they are already entrenched in Boston, is that you can build around the team. Like you're buying the team, but you're also buying everything that goes into owning a team in a specific area. So if, say, hypothetically, the win bought majority interest in the Celtics in much the same way that uh, the Adelson family bought controlling interest in the Dallas Mavericks. You could build out an arena in Everett, uh, which they've been looking to do. I mean, we know they've been interested in, in an arena for the or stadium for the revolution. You know, they've been eyeballing stuff like this for a while. If you bought the Celtics, you could build an arena down there and make them the centerpiece of, of a, you know, an attraction in, in that area. And, and again, this is not new. The Adelsons are, are currently in the process of, of doing that. Um, if there is a team, and I know it's Vegas, but if there is a team in Las Vegas, it will almost certainly play in an arena resort of some sort that is built for them for the long term. So this is kind of a trend line in the NBA with these valuations being so big that it, it it sort of makes a, a casino partner a little bit more appealing. Chris, walking this back just a few steps, because this was shocking news to us this morning or this afternoon whenever it broke. Did you get a sense that this was a possibility uh, for Wick Grosbeck and his family? And do you have any sense of how long this news has been in the works, uh, how, how long they've been planning it? No, no, honestly, no, I did not expect this kind of announcement to come because Wick Grosbeck has, you know, he's a relatively young guy and he's always struck me as someone that thoroughly enjoys being an NBA owner. He, he's not Mark Cuban, but he's at majority of the games available for reporters to, to talk to on and off the record. Uh, he seems to really enjoy all of this. So, I am curious to know some of the reasons and the language in that statement was, was interesting, you know, for, you know, citing estate planning and family matters. Uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but that didn't, I haven't, I've asked about this and I haven't quite gotten clarification on why that, what that language specifically was used. Um, so it, it was, the announcement was shocking. I guess, you know, in the aftermath, though, as I've talked to enough people and kind of ownership sources around the NBA, it shouldn't be all that surprising, I guess, if you just look at the simple math of it all. I mean, the Celtics are probably never going to be more valuable. You've got a TV deal that's about to begin in a year or so, and everybody kind of knows what those numbers are going to be, right? We know it's going to be, you know, a 10 or 11-year deal, $7 billion per year, uh, the Celtics still have some stability with their regional sports network, which is something that scares a lot of owners uh, out there, the future of those local uh, broadcast rights. And they're an NBA champion with a roster that is well-positioned to be you know, championship level for several years to come. Selling now not only would probably net you the biggest return, but it also saves you from what are going to be monster luxury tax bills that you have to pay over the next couple of years. I was asking some capologists recently about, you know, kind of the, the, the money the Celtics are going to be invested in after this Derek White deal. And, and we're talking, you know, with tax penalties 
a payroll that costs them about four hundred fifty five hundred million dollars per year. That's an NBA record for the amount that the Celtics are going to have to pay. And they're, they're still valuable regardless of that, but they're a lot less valuable when those tax penalties, which the NBA has has you know purposefully inserted in these last two collective bargaining agreements, when they really start to kick in. So financially, selling your team right now or before the end of the year or before the end of next season um, makes a lot of fiscal sense for Wick Grousebeck if he's looking to maximize his investment. We're talking with Chris Mannix, Sports Illustrated. I was going to just follow up on that, uh, Chris, what you just said, is that, yeah, it's a legacy organization. They just won a championship, but it's an extremely expensive roster, uh, full of uh, tax penalties and all of that. If Wick Grossbeck was planning on doing this, isn't his behavior over the last, since the season ended even, with all these uh, re-signings and everything, Derek White, they didn't even put the ink on that uh, contract before this whole thing got announced. How do you sort of square that if they're trying to bring back a team, maybe so the next owner can have it run himself? Like, why why would you do all those things if you're trying to position it for a sale? Well, uh, I think, if look, the money is, is obviously significant, but anyone that wants to buy in on a team it's more appealing if they know it's going to be really good. Like, you know, putting aside the market size, which is obviously a factor in in buying a team, like you're much more eager to buy the Celtics than you are the Portland Trailblazers because you know you know what the Celtics are going to be at least for the next four or five years if you continue to invest in them. They're kind of turnkey in that way, whereas some of these other organizations, you know, it's going to take a while and they might wind up losing money um, while you're trying to to kind of turn things around. And what look, one thing that Wick Grousebeck has told Brad Stevens and members of that front office over the last couple of years is that if we have a player on this team that is helping us win a championship, don't worry about the money. I, I will spend the money to keep that guy in place. And to me, the announcement of the Derek White signing, which everybody knew for the last couple of weeks was going to happen, this was – this was as, as, as no-brainer for the Celtics and Derek White as it is giving Jason Tatum his max extension, which I expect to come in the days and weeks uh, ahead. Uh, this, to me, was, was evidence of that, proof of that, that Derek White, who was invaluable to the Celtics' success, um, you know, Wick Grosbeck saw it and was willing to reward it. Chris, I, I want to explore the the RSN uh, portion of it that you referenced earlier. We were reading a, a story out of Dallas from when Mark Cuban sold the team. He referenced uh, the RSNs, right? They were Diamond Sports, I think, which went bankrupt. Uh, you mentioned that NBC Sports Boston is on on better footing. They're not as concerned as other teams. But why, why is that such a scary proposition for owners, and will this lead to more owners selling? Well, it, it's less money, right? Um and you can people can kind of scoff at the revenue that these RSNs bring in when compared to, you know, the national TV money that is going to come in. But and look, I, I know we're talking about huge dollar sums, but half that goes to the players. Then you distribute it, and it, so it gets the pie gets chopped up, you know, a lot before each owner gets his taste. So that RSN money, even though you know some of that is shared as well, that RSN money is is money they like. It's money they, they can count on. And right now, for the Celtics, you know, that money's pretty good. I think they own, what, 20% of NBC Sports Boston as well. So, like, that, that money is, is good for them, and, and they've got years left on that contract. But three, four, five years from now, nobody can say what the RSN business is going to look like. The, the Bally Diamond stuff, it terrified people how, how quickly they kind of went bankrupt and, and all the issues they caused throughout several of, of the major sports. So the fact that that money might, that that revenue stream might be significantly lessened, you know, uh, uh, several years from now, that, that's a factor in all this. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Like, if Wick Grouchbeck knew that at some point he was going to sell, be it this year, three years, five years, if he wasn't looking to make this team a family legacy that he passes on, you know, to his children, well, this is probably the perfect time to do it. You know, this is probably the moment that you are going to get maximum value for your asset. I want to ask you about some of this language that was in the the announcement that the uh, Celtics made. I, I'm guessing in conjunction with the Boston Basketball Partners LLC. It's just at the very end, because I know this is something fans keep repeating a lot, that the managing board of the ownership group expects to sell the majority interest this year or next 
with the balance closing in 2028, but that Wick Rousbeck will remain the governor of the team until the second closing in 2028. Do you have any idea how much power, how much involvement he'll still have in the Celtics once, you know, the first part of that sale goes through and he has this governor title, but what is what does that possibly entail when somebody else has a majority stake in the team? I'll be honest. I, I don't see that happening. Um, look, Mark Cuban still has a percentage ownership, 27% ownership of the Dallas Mavericks. And when that sale originally went through just, what, six, seven months ago, Mark Cuban talked about how he would still be running day-to-day operations. Well, he's not anymore. Like Nico Harrison is reporting to Patrick Dumont, who is the governor of that team now. Mark is obviously still heavily involved, but he is not the final say on on decisions in that organization. And I think that whenever it is that Wick Crossbeck uh, sells this team or sells his controlling interest in this team, whoever buys it is going to have their own plan. They're going to want their own governor in place well before, I think, 2028. That, look, <laughs> There was so much, so much in that statement in just two paragraphs. That second paragraph, um, the way I interpreted it, and I can tell you it's a way that multiple people inside the NBA interpreted it, is that they are going to try to attempt something Minnesota just did, which is sort of a tiered sale, uh, sale process where you put up a chunk of money now, maybe a chunk of money two years from now, and the sale closes in, in 2028. Now, I don't know that specifically to be – to be true, but that's how it read. And that's how people, some people I talked to in the NBA ultimately read it as well. I I promise you, if that's the case, it is a non-starter with the league. The Minnesota Timberwolves, how they went through this was an embarrassment, where Glenn Taylor sold a chunk of the team, A-Rod came in, Mark Lurie came in, and now they go to these games and they can't even look at each other because they're involved in mediation because Glenn Taylor decided he didn't want to sell the team anymore. The NBA... In the aftermath of that mess, and Adam Silver's gone on record about this, and I've talked to enough people that, that, that back it up, you either sell the team or you don't, right? Like you have a, a sale date where your interest gets p- passed on to somebody else or you don't. There is going to be no more tiered sales system where you buy a team in chunks because that Minnesota situation, which has played out very publicly and in a very ugly way over the last – you know, six, seven months. That is not something the NBA is looking to get involved in again. All right, Mannix, we spent the better part of today talking and uh, discussing who the next possible owner could be. Uh, Are there any names out there, anybody that you sort of know behind the scenes who've been really itching to buy an NBA team but who's uh, not really out there and hasn't really made that public? Is there any any, uh, breadcrumbs you can give us there? John John Henry. Like John Henry or uh, somebody like that? Yeah, all I can say is I have not heard the the Fenway Sports Group mentioned yet as – as a potential owner, but I, I do believe this process is set to move relatively quickly. And you saw in that statement, like they want to sell this team by the end of 2024 or early 2025, in part, I'm sure, for some of the reasons I articulated, like you don't want to be on the hook for that tax bill when it comes at the end of next season and certainly not the one after that. Um, but I, I don't, it, you know, look, I, I don't know specifically who would be in the mix, just that I've had enough people kind of metaphorically tap me on the shoulder and say, watch out for some of these these casino groups that, that could come in and try to make a splash. And look, that's that's incredibly complicated. Like we mentioned the win. And they, they as you guys know, like and people in Boston know, like the when the win brought their 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 casino into Massachusetts, it came with a lot of strings, right? Like they're the only casino our only gambling entity that can operate in the eastern Massachusetts area. Like, you can have a license there. You can have a license out in Springfield. You can do – you can operate in certain sections. So, right now, really, the win would have a, a stranglehold on, on – on, if they wanted to jump in and make an offer. But the win part, – a part owner of the win is Tillman Fertitta, who is the majority owner of the Houston Rockets. How would that work? I've also heard some things about maybe, you know, the owners of the win wanting to sell – and get out, and maybe somebody else can come in. So it's incredibly complicated how, how all that would work. But that's just what I was, was kind of told in the hours after that announcement. Keep an eye on, on some, of these, some of this casino money 
you know, coming in and, and trying to make a, make a splash. Okay. He is Chris Mannix, Sports Illustrated. Excellent, excellent work. Uh, thank you for joining us here, Chris. You can check out all of his work on Twitter as well at SI Chris Mannix. Chris, we appreciate the time. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you down the line. You got it, guys.